Friday, Friday yeah. at 10 o'clock. Okay. Yeah. okay. Right on time, man. Right on time. Um, let me uh, introduce myself. My name is uh, Zaki Baruti, and I'm President General of the Universal African People's Organization. And um, again, I just want to say good morning. Uh, I appreciate the invitation for being here. When contacted by Annie Luker, he asked that I choose a topic uh, if, uh, in terms of based on participation. And I chose the topic of putting an end to the racial oppression of black people here in this country and throughout the world. So to that end, will be our discussion. Uh, sitting next to me, I'll let him introduce himself. Uh, Reverend Elston McCowan, I'm the Minister General for the Universal African People's Organization, co-coordinator of the Gateway Green Alliance, and the first vice president of St. Louis City Chapter of NAACP. Just to name a few. <laughs> let me uh, also give you a little background of our organization. Uh, uh, the Universal African Peoples Organization was founded on April the 4th, 1989. And it was founded as an extension of my candidacy for governor of the state of Missouri. I ran for governor in 1984 as well as in 1988 as a Democratic uh, candidate, in the, I mean in the Democratic Party. And so those who was with me at that particular time, a number of my allies, we wanted to continue in terms of the movement to address the issues that we were addressing as a candidate for a government. And we chose to create an organization and a historical study of various organizations coming out of uh, and emanating out of uh, the black community took us to the study of the movement led by the Honorable Marcus Masai Garvey, who in the early 20th century was head of the Universal Negro Improvement Association. And we felt that the concepts that uh, he articulated at that point in time and the kind of membership that he had of over four million people of color, uh, not only in this country but throughout the world, we said why try to uh, reinvent the wheel and just carry forth for uh, his work. So to that end, uh, we chose April the 4th as our founding date because April the 4th was the assassination date of Dr. King. And in the spirit of Marcus Garvey and in the spirit of Dr. King, we say it uh, in terms of the pursuit of uh, justice and equality that we would go forward. So um, in the title of President General, uh, Marcus Garvey utilized that title. And even though we have a small army, we're hoping to increase the army so that we can have uh, some justice in our lifetime here in this country and throughout the world. But before I begin, let me just take a quick survey of who we are talking with. How many people in here uh, uh, are socialists? Raise your hand, the socialists, okay. I mean, are the communists? Okay, that. How many in here also believe in the greater being, like the God figure, I mean, God thought we got, okay. I just wanted to kind of have a sense of uh, who we will be addressing today. Um, let me, when we talk about the oppression of black people and being a person of color and seeing and being also very involved over the years, in fact, I've been personally involved in the movement since I was 17 years old, just a little bit of background on myself. I came from, uh, was raised in uh, East St. Louis, Illinois. I'm the oldest of 10 children. Uh, lived in literally uh, real poverty-stricken area, even though we didn't know the poverty because we had a close-knit uh, uh, neighborhood, uh, and we were in an area that was literally like the last house uh, in the city, on the city boundaries, um, in a place called East Street. And as I was growing up, I guess there were some things that uh, came into my consciousness, consciousness that uh, awoken me personally to what is happening to the black community. One of the earliest memories was when I was in junior high school and walking to the high school, junior high school, saw big posters all around the area of Emmett Till. And many of you probably know about the situation of Emmett Till, a young black youth who was brutally slain in Mississippi for allegedly whistling at a white lady. And then as I continued to progress, I used to always wonder 
Uh, we were right next door to what we call my Santa, which was Eminem, you know, putting out real foul odors in our neighborhood that, in fact, today I think there's a planned lawsuit for the kinds of health uh, 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 issues that had occurred because of what they were doing at that point in time. And I used to see a parade of cars going through our neighborhood to work in my center. And all of those parade of cars would be basically white workers going to work. And again, this is in high school, so that was something that, you know, I saw as contradictory. And i never forget um, uh, early on going to a couple of rallies where we had black power speakers at that time, notably uh, Stokely Carmack, who I later uh, had a great association with. And at the rally, he was uh, saying uh, and speaking to the fact that we as a people, I'm speaking of black people, how we have been psychologically damaged. And he used the example of, and growing up in our neighborhood, one of my heroes was Tarzan. <laughs> and he was uh, 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 pointing out the fact that here as a people, we rooting for Tarzan, a little small white man, a boy in the middle of the jungle, whooping our people and controlling the animals. So like a light bulb went up in my head saying, you are absolutely correct in terms of the psychological kinds of impact that this society has had on our people in terms of us not loving ourselves and having hero worship within our community. I can recall many times growing up in all the neighborhoods when, because our people are very spiritual people, that many homes had pictures of Jesus and uh, all of the Jesus pictures were there of long haired white images, okay? Mm -hmm. Psychological damages. Then I guess one of the most, also I, when I went off to college at SIU Evansville, I joined the uh, student movement. It was one of the organizers. And we did at that point in time, if y'all recall, during the 60s, there were a lot of seizures of, on the college campuses. And we did likewise at SIU of administration buildings, calling for greater black studies and uh, programs and hiring more uh, black workers. I mean, uh, 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 faculty members. I left that and uh, began to be involved in the Panther movement. And the way I became involved in the Panther movement, which was one of the turning points for my life as far as the radicalization, was the assassination uh, and murder of Fred Hampton and Mark Clark. They were members of the Black Panther Party uh, in Illinois, where uh, the FBI and the state's attorney at that time, Hanahan, I think that was his name, uh, in the middle of the night at 5 a.m. came in shooting, claiming that the Panther shot at them, but came out and was proven later that uh, the police had shot into their home over a hundred times and only one shot that went out. And that was a systematic, like I said, the murder of Fred Hampton and Mark Clark. So that bothered me so, it was just as if my biological brothers had been killed and I organized a march and demonstration in East St. Louis and from that point on, I guess the rest is history in terms of my involvement, working with the Panthers, working with the Black United Front, and doing a lot of other different activities, including, uh, also I failed to mention, that as head of the organization, we do publish a quarterly newspaper that's called the African News World that again deals with issues facing our people. So that's my, my background and how I've grown to uh, see the world from the perspective of a black man. And why do we say there's oppression? Of course, everyone knows about the historical oppression of one of the most evil crimes against humanity being taking place during the dreaded uh, slave trade where a whole people were redefined almost like into Frankensteinian uh, mode in terms of losing culture, uh, self-identification, reduced to chattel uh, property, treated without no sense of humanity, families destroyed, etc., etc. And so today, 
much of what occurred there, if you really look deep, we still have that psychosis that still exists today. And why do I say that? First of all, when we look at the oppression of black people, I want everybody to be clear that there is a systematic prison industrial system that incarcerates black people in unprecedented levels. Many times, and I had, I grabbed the wrong newspaper, but this is a past issue of our newspaper, and I recall on one of the issues that I was grabbing to bring here, which I do have as a modern day statistical analysis, that black men, or black males, constitute 6% of the United States population. Mind you, 6%. Yet, in terms of the incarceration of black males all throughout America, it's at a rate of 50, anywhere from 60 to 80% of those who are incarcerated in this country today are black males. When we look at it, and the shame of it, and the task for folks in terms of breaking the racial oppression and just the general psychosis of America is that this country locks up more people than any other country in the world. But if you look at the statistical rate, black males and per $100,000, and this is a research that was done uh, by the United Kingdom House Office Research that uh, in year 2008, there were over 2 million prisoners held in federal, state, and local jails. Now this is the breakdown racially, per 100,000. For black males, per 100,000, it was 4,777 black inmates per 100,000. For Hispanics, 1,760 Hispanics per 100,000. For white males, 727 white males per 100,000. Mind you the, the gap. Unless black people are innately criminal, something obviously is wrong and needs to be addressed. 4,778 black males per 100,000 and 727 white males per 100,000. So that's point one. Point two, and to really delve into the psychosis, because when the people don't know themselves and have not been taught to hate themselves, also, and it's been done through different studies, one notably, uh, with Franz Fanon, the wretched of the earth, when he was looking at the Algerian case where the French were oppressing uh, the Algerians, that you had uh, the people, the oppressed people, turning on to themselves in terms of vicious manners. Let me give you another statistic. And uh, we say, maintain, this is still an ex extension of a society that has systematically created the kind of social disorder in our community. But before I go to that, because I was going to cite some murder statistics, another point in terms of the inherent race, racism, when we look at the drug laws, mindful, you know, that was passed during the time of Clinton, mm -hmm. who uh, many folks considered at one time being the first black president, of course, uh, I had problems with that. <laughs> but the drug law, because it's always spoken been a war on drugs, and the war on drugs is just a, a smoke screen, in our uh, opinion, that seriously have a war on drugs, uh, I mean a war on the black community on two levels. One is, most of the drugs don't come and are not manufactured, first of all, within the black community. They come from outside, and we take the position that the bankers and the uh, government officials, mind you, we can never forget the Iran Contra scandal where the CIA here at that time, George Bush, was involved in uh, you know, 
Y'all remember the uh, Contras involved in the uh, uh, drug trade for weapons to be sent to Iran, I believe. Right. Anyway, when you have laws that says uh, the drug uh, um, crack, a little vial of crack which comes as a derivative from what? The powder cocaine. And they say that it has been proven that powder cocaine, cocaine has, was the preferred choice of the drug out of the white community and the crack cocaine out of the black community, the poor man's drug. But for a little vial of crack, if you are caught with by uh, being possessing of it, you would get triple or double the sentence of if you had a larger quantity of the powder cocaine. So again, that just showed the kind of disparity and the raceness uh, involved in the sentencing of black people here in this country. So that's what we say again is a clear-cut example of racial oppression. When you look at the fact, I'm part of an organization also that's called the Coalition Against Police Crimes and Repression. And one of the things that we were much concerned with is the disproportionate stops of black people on the streets and highways of America. <laughs> Because of our activism, we were able to push it through, I think in the early 2000s, uh, legislation out of the General Assembly that mandated the Attorney General to do a study each year to see if there's disproportionate stops of black folks on the highways and byways of America. And every year since that was mandated, it's been proven that black people are disproportionately stopped. Yet, Yet, nothing has been done about it. No type of action to resolve that particular issue. If you go to many of the municipalities, in fact, I think one clear example was Ladue. And we know there's not a whole lot of black folks in Ladue, then. <laughs> am I right? Yeah. But if you go to the traffic courts, the traffic courts uh, of Ladue have been filled with black people. And in fact, the police chief uh, resigned from the Ladu or was fired, one of the other, I forgot the exact circumstance, because he said he was mandated by the mayor to make sure that they stopped those folks that didn't look like the Ladu, Ladu residents. So again, clear example of racial oppression. Let me give you, and we all should be concerned, but again, the psychosis that happens in our community. We had, in one of our early newspapers, we said we must stop the senseless and rampant murders and crimes in our communities. And we did a 10-year uh, I mean, study of, of murder in uh, both the black and white communities. And from 1991 through 1983, there were over 168,789 murders committed throughout America during that period. When you look at the black on, uh, uh, murder victims, it was 77, even though black people are only projected by the United States Census at 10%, it was 77,087 murders of uh, victims that were black, which constituted like 45% of all the victims. So some people would say, hell, black folks are just killing themselves. <laughs> And why? But we're saying that when you look at the kind of economic oppression that causes people, first of all, not to have a sense of worth, and they turn themselves, as I was mentioning earlier, the wretched of the earth, France for nine, unto themselves, helps create that kind of atmosphere. So, uh, so again, we see that as a systematic extension of what we consider the racial oppression of America. I just got to cite a few more statistics, then I'm going to stop and have my brother say, give some few comments, and then we'll look at what should be done. Even we did a research in one of our newspapers, this is a past issue, where we were saying uh, preparing for the 21st century by improving our mental and physical health reducing and eliminating the 10 biggest killers of blacks in, in this country. But let's look at the disproportionateness 
when it comes to race on this situation. Black people, and this comes from the National Center for Health Statistics, black people are impacted by cancer 32% higher than the rest of the community. Heart disease, 38%. Cirrhosis or liver disease, 77%. Strokes, 82%. Diabetes, 132%. These are not statistics I'm making up. This comes from the National Health Center statistics. Kidney failure, 170%. Homicide, 500%, as I had gave the other statistics. So the black community, again, is under unprecedented attack. Going back to economics, they say that the unemployment uh, rate here in this country is what? Right at 9%. I understand it's supposed to drop by uh, a few points. I mean, eight, it was 8.8% 8 .8 now, I believe. But it's also statistically shown that even that's the general unemployment rate, but in the black community, it's double that. For black youth between the ages of 20 and 35 is up at 40 percent. The old adage, last hire, first fire, is really still a reality today. And, and so that's another issue that we need to deal with. Policing of our communities. Most of the rebellions people called back in the 60s and all the way up through Rodney King beatings called those actions of the people in the communities riots. I always call them rebellions. But every rebellion in this country, including Dr. King, which set off over 100 rebellions, was caused by some action of the police forces across America. If we examine the police department and the composition of the police officers, again, we see clear-cut racism. And if you look at it statistically, an example, in the city of St. Louis, the black population is 54% or 53%, so, you know, that's arguable. Yet, if you look at the police officers, that patrol the communities, 70% are white. Again, taking jobs and many times having a police force that come into our community that do not have the same sense of the cultural uh, uh, alliances or you know, relationships with the people of the community that they are patrolled. In essence, like occupying Forces, just like the United States have occupying forces in other places of the world. In fact, this country has more overseas bases of military than any other country in the world. Why? That's an issue that, in the broader sense, that we need to address. Then, finally, political. Our organization pushes the concept that we should have if we are to have a just and equitable society, politically, as long as we have this political system, then we are to have proportionate political representation. Meaning that wherever percentage we are of the population on the national, state, and local level, then we are to have that in terms of proportion of political power. To me, that makes common sense. So if they say on the national level, black people are 10% of the population, then logically for me, then 10% of all the elected officials ought to be of our people. But in the year 2011, of course, that's not the situation. There are over 500,000 plus elected officials in this country. Of that, even though we see some high profile elected black officials, of that number in the year 2011, only 10,500 were black people, which translates to about 3%, less than 3%. If you look at the people who make the decisions, and also I know that, like the United States Senate, is really a reflection of money. But if you look on the race level, of 100 United States, oh, let me, before I go there, 
of that 500,000 instead of just 10,000, 10 percent, let's just say we round it off at 500,000, should be what? 50,000 black elected officials, providing some, you know, uh, representing our people. However, if you look at the United States Senate, one of the highest bodies uh, of making decisions to fund wars and uh, uh, dealing with education and et cetera, et cetera, of a hundred in a year, even though we got a high profile person of color in the United States presidency, but if you look at the United States Senate today out of a hundred senators, not one is a person of color. That ought to be, that's a crying shame in our opinion. And if we were empowered in terms of proportionate political power of 100 U.S. senators, minimally, if we say 10%, probably it's 13, at least 10 to 13 ought to be black people. And you could say the same thing at the governorship, that out of 50 governors in this country, only one is black, and probably hardly, uh, only about seven or eight other statewide elected officials are black. So again, out of one governor, if we had proportionate political representation, we would have at least five to six. And then I had said finally, but this would be the final point. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just have to get all that out. So that you have a picture of what we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. On the educational tip, I'm a former educator. Very outspoken in the public school system in East St. Louis. In fact, I was taken out of the classroom. But one of the problems when I was saying the lack of, uh, 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 of unity in our community and consciousness and the psychosis is the real is the curriculum. That and curriculum, of course, is state mandated. Our children coming through, and that's part followed of the black community. But if you look at the general society. Is part of the policy coming from the state houses is that we have an educational system that does not teach our people their true history. Because if they knew their true history, then they would have a greater sense of dignity and pride in themselves and would not be easily led by some of the uh, crazy uh, uh, rap that's out here and the kind of crazy psychosis that exists in our community. So I say that we ought to have an educational system that teaches our children that we were a great people prior to enslavement. Out of Egypt, out of Ghana, out of Mali, out of Zimbabwe. And that our people, as they were being enslaved, had heroic uh, struggles against enslavement. That our people had heroic rebellions during the period of slavery. That there were heroic people like Nat Turner and Denmark Vesey and et cetera, et cetera, who fought against that. That there were heroic people like Marcus Garvey, W.E.B. Du Bois, et cetera, et cetera, and the Panther Movement that fought against this system. Then our children would have a greater sense, but the greater society don't want that. And then also I found a very interesting article coming out of Chicago through the Black Star Project where... Uh, they had did a study, and this is another touchy issue, but it's an issue that needs to be addressed head on, of teachers, who's teaching our children. As I mentioned about the police department being disproportionately white, in many areas this, we have disproportionately number of white teachers teaching our children. And I found it interesting because early on, I'm a, I've written a couple booklets on education, and back in 1980, I had pointed out that same fact that as my observation took me uh, in, in, in terms of surveying the educational system at that time, that there were too many white teachers teaching our children because you don't have that same sense that of the cultural uh, high endness or uh, connection mm -hmm. that you would have uh, with uh, a person of your same race. Can you imagine that if we had disproportionate number of white, I mean black teachers teaching in Ladue, what would happen in terms of the issues that would be raised by the residents there? So those are some of how I view and our organization view 
what has taken place here in this country. And then all you got to also look at what this country has done to black people outside of its borders, including the invasion in 1915 of Haiti, the invasion of this country of Grenada, when this country went into Panama, bombing to get rid of Noruega, they, you don't hear much information about over 4,000 people of color in Panama being uh, killed uh, there. And I can go on and on and on, the ex exploitation and the rape that's taking place in Africa today. So we maintain to our progressive white allies that the racial oppression of our people is real, and if we don't have a different kind of society, if we want to have a socialist society, it has to be free of the racial oppression. There have to be serious laws that punish to max any kind of systematic uh, uh, acts of racism. And so to that end, and we can get into some details of how do we make that happen. So I just wanted to give that overview. And I'm going to turn it over to my good brother, Reverend Elson, for his comments. Okay. Let's give it up. I think that was a wonderful overview. I think uh, as I keep uh, touch on very uh, my, quite a few uh, very important points. But let's let's talk about racism as it's defined, because everybody has different types of ideas about racism. What 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 is racism? And uh, Maulana Karanga, uh, who was the founder of uh, Kwanzaa uh, and, and, and developed the uh, Guzo Sabi Southern Principles, he defined racism as the systematic oppression of one group of people over another. He also begins to break down uh, racism and its power. Uh, racism, you can only be a racist if you have power to exercise your authority over another group of people. Uh, probably 1964 or somewhere thereabouts when he came out with these particular doctrines and these particular statements, uh, African Americans were not necessarily in power positions to exercise any forms of racism because we were still considered to be a powerless people. Uh, we probably need to look at and look at racism once again and, and find out it's a, a more modern definition. But for the most part, for the most part, whites in this country control this country. Even though you might have the President of the United States as an African American uh, male, you still have the vast majority of folk that I come in contact with, because I don't get a chance to walk up to President Obama. I get a chance to walk up to President General, uh, Zaki Brody, but I don't get a chance to walk up to President Obama. So for the most part, the oppression that I experience is not coming from Obama. The oppression that I experience comes from the community, the city, the state in which I reside, and the states that are surrounding pretty much the places I go. Uh, so racism defined, again, is a systematic oppression of one group of people over another. Okay? Um, I want to talk real quick about how I got involved. I think uh, Zaki gave a pretty good uh, uh, history of how he got involved. I, I was uh, 13 years old, and I lived next door to um, Alderman Samuel Kennedy. And he had two sons, uh, had some more children, but two sons in particular, uh, Terry and Gary Kennedy. Um, Terry Kennedy is Alderman now of the city of St. Louis uh, in the 18th Ward. They were next door doing what's called the South African Gumbo. And as a 13-year-old fella, I thought that was pretty impressive. They had these boots on, and they'd be out there. It was almost like, uh, you know, how you do, what, what, do you, what do you call those things when the, when the college campus, they step. It was almost like a step show. They would do a step show, and they would do it in gum boots. And um, you know what gum boots are. Those are fireman boots. That's what we call them, gum boots. They come on ball to your knee, and they're rubber. They made them uh, rubber. Okay. And so they're slapping around with the gum boots and all that. I said, man, you guys ought to show me how to do that. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, we show you how to do that. We gotta go do performances and stuff. Would you be interested in going? Performing? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, sure. So they told teach me South Africa. But after they, they moved into a performance, and as we were dancing, uh, they shared with me uh, the history of the South African Gumbo dance. And they shared with me that in South Africa at that particular time, back in 19, well, I would say that about probably 79 or seven, actually 77, back in 1977. Uh, that, uh, that Nelson Mandela was in prison 
uh, that uh, 10 months out of the year, the Africans, uh, the black Africans, are forced to go on trains, move away from their family for 10 months out of the year, and go on coal mines, zinc mines, diamond mines, etc. And then when they get off the train, they come back, they have a celebration, and they uh, have a feast. And uh, one of the things that they do is they do this gumbo dance, uh, emulating uh, you know, the work that they did in the mine, as well as the sound of the train. Um, and so I, I thought that was a fascinating history. And not only did we begin to do that, but we also began to talk about other historical uh, issues. Now prior to that, actually prior to me joining with, uh, uh, I guess to call it the Sudan Illustrators at that particular time, prior to joining that, my mom was always, you know, a very Afrocentric person. She wore her in a short uh, pop afro. Uh, uh, she was always fighting with people, telling them, you know, that person jumped me, they didn't jump me because they were like, did you see that son and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, that's why that, it's racism, you know? <laughs> yeah, but she made sure she understood who our historical figures were and all that kind of thing. So it was a natural attraction to see somebody else uh, like me because, you know, it was kind of a strange thing. Of, you know, you all heard a lot of black power stuff back in those days, but you really didn't see folks really acting it out. And uh, Wow, five minutes? Okay, thank you. All right, boy. Time goes by fast, we have fun. Well, anyway, Zaki did a real good job of explaining everything, and I'll, I'll tell you what, let me just sum it up all by saying that uh, I've been in the movement <laughs> every time. It's all about that. And uh, we just want to open up for questions at this point. Yeah. Time, because I don't even know we're like that. I'm, 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 yeah. Well, yeah. We still got more than five minutes, guys. Look at that clock. Three minutes. Oh, oh 45. Oh, that's right. It's concerning. You know, I feel like in some ways, in terms of our of racism in our country, we're, we're going backwards, in a sense, you know, with what's going on with housing. And, but also, do you have any statistics on the, uh, of the number of blacks and whites in prison like 20 years ago? It seems to me that it's rapidly increased over like the last maybe 30 years. Yes. Yeah, if you watch all the little gangster movies, they go to prison, it's all white people. Right. <laughs> right, right, right. Something like one black guy. Right. But, um, but I, I, that would be interesting. And, you know, what's that about? What's causing that? What's the economic basis right. of that? Well, you know, there's a couple of levels. Number one is, uh, first of all, statistically, I'm sure we can find the statistics to see the growth of uh, uh, a greater number of blacks being incarcerated. Uh -huh. Uh, prison, I guess an increasing prison population in general overall as well. Yeah, but, yeah. but I mean, but the percentage-wise, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, and that's oh, yeah. as I mentioned earlier, uh, that's an extension of those drug laws uh, that okay. uh, occurred uh, during the Clinton administration. So uh, yes, and uh, that's done on two levels with the outsourcing of. Uh, Many of, uh, at the same time when Clinton was doing that, if we look back and do some real analytical observation, uh, you recall they passed, what, the NAFTA Act, where many of the jobs went uh, outside this country, meaning uh, there was a job loss in the black, white community, but with the prison population boom, that created also jobs. jobs. When you look at those who, uh, in many of the rural neighborhoods, the building of uh, the prisons that created jobs for construction workers. Uh, you had the folks who had to man the prisons. You had the little towns that uh, serviced the families that come to the prison. When you look at the police the force, it increased the number of police officers. So it served, uh, uh, in a sense, indirectly, not indirectly, indirectly, you know, the white community with the greater incarceration of the black community. Uh, so. So yes to your answer on that. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm just going to be real quick, and just, uh, real quick on that point. Um, I, I would also add that I, I don't think it's probably a good idea to look to movies about the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Accurate information. I, I, don't, I don't doubt the incarceration rates uh, increase, but uh, I, would, I, would, I would assume that the incarceration rate has always been overrepresented for right. folks in prison. But I, I would also real quick add a uh, positive point. I think that the struggle for equality um, and the end of racism is, is intimately tied to the struggle against capitalism. In right. my opinion. I don't think there's a resolution to that problem within the confines of the capitalist system. Um, and, uh, and so, in my, in, my opinion, in my opinion, a real solution to the, to the problem of racism requires a united struggle of white workers and black workers, uh, a sort of multiracial struggle to end, end capitalism and end racism as well. And I think we need to look for, for demands that sort of tie those together. Uh, 
I'll, I'll be quick and get this uh, I'm in total agreement, and that's I'm glad we. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry we didn't get really into how we're going to achieve that. But my study is when you look at, and uh, you know, how do we achieve the overthrow of capitalism? Mm -hmm. I mean, if that's going to be the true goal, because historically everyone know that uh, uh, the overthrow of capitalism, from my study, was not real peaceful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know. I may be wrong, and this might be a whole new uh, model, but, uh, you know, uh, that would have to be, if we're really talking about solving racial oppression, yes, I totally agree that we have to have a whole new social order in this particular society. Short of that, then we will have these continuous struggles uh, here in this country around that issue. But that goes back to, again, how do we make that happen? When you look at this country has the greatest, first of all, all the layers of weaponry in a sense, police force. You know, you've got, what, million some police officers across this country probably. Then you got the layer of the state police. Then you got the militia. I mean, you know, you got a lot of layers. So how do you get enough folks out? And that's why I was asking about early on the socialists. If we don't be serious, it's going to take real serious organization to make something happen in this society. And that's why I was hoping we have a little hope through the Occupy movement right. that that would grow and grow. But again, you know, there's a movement to dissipate that. Yeah, Jonathan. I just want to say that, um, you know, looking at our society, this, this particular society, I think we are now walking to a global society. And I, I think we fail to really, really look at what started off with this, like the, the oppression of the global south. I think um, a lot of our, the things that we have in the excess is because we um, take from these countries in the global south. And, and now we are trying to build them up because that's what capitalism would do. It would destroy this. To, to make money over there, and I, I think, uh, I, I'm, I just think we have... Let me stop like, you right quick. You used the word just as Malcolm would correct you, we, you know what I'm saying, the others, the capitalists, okay? Because you're not doing it, right? You're not doing it, all right. All right, go ahead, I'm sorry. I just think you got, you got a big um, agenda of really wiping the slate with, uh, with what colonialism did, you know, 500 years ago. Okay then, absolutely. Uh, look like we have to get ready to close out. Sorry. Close down.